Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Old Tunes Fresh Takes podcast. This is the podcast where we learn old tunes, record fresh takes of them and encourage you to do the same. This is for musicians of all styles and abilities. If you play a bit of ukulele, can make a beat on your laptop or just fancy having a sing, we want to hear from you. We don't care if your version is recorded on your phone or in Abbey Road, we want to hear it. And you certainly don't have to consider yourself a folk musician. We're especially keen to hear from people who could change these songs into something completely different, an entirely fresh take. So if you want to take part, go and check out our Facebook, Twitter and SoundCloud pages to find a full list of songs we'll be working on this series, including scores, chord sheets and lyrics. Links to these can be found in the description of this episode. I'm Tim Woodson. And I'm Jack the Robot. And this month we'll be looking at Cruel Mother. So, Tim, you've chosen Cruel Mother, so do you want to tell us a bit about it? Yeah, cool. So, Cruel Mother, this tune, uh, when I first started getting into the world of English folk music, uh, I basically put together a mammoth playlist that I would have uh, just going on shuffle as I was walking around. Yeah, I had some quite mixed responses to a lot of the stuff on that, but this this was the first one that actually made me stop uh, physically in my tracks. Yeah. Because, you know, often the, the, the words kind of wash over you the first couple of times. And then and then when these gradually began to sink in, I was thought, oh gosh, this isn't pleasant. Yeah, it's it's really dark. So tell us the story. Sure. So uh, the, essentially what happens is you you encounter this, this lady, uh, the eponymous cruel mother. Uh, she's It kind of becomes clear that she's uh, pregnant by uh, some sort of Ill- illegitimate means, potentially. The first half of the tune is where she goes and has her children, which in the version I'm used to there uh, there are two boys oh really because i because the version you sent me there's three man you know there's there's also you can have as many as you like but you know a, a, a feasible number of i think it's, it's clear that there's more than one anyway right and very quickly pretty much all the versions i've heard this this lady then pulls out uh, a pen knife and uh, and kills him stabs him mm gosh (laughs) (laughs) and so the the tune then jumps forward in time and this lady is 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 out walking again and she meets these uh these three boys out in the street and you know essentially she she looks at them and she goes oh i like the look of you guys you know if you were my kids i'd treat you well and then they kind of look back and go well we were yours and you didn't treat as well. Uh, you kind of stabbed us there. Uh, and then she goes, oh man, well, you know, what's what's going to happen to me then? And then they kind of outline three kind of fates that she may well, three punishments that she may well encounter. Sort of curses, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's a dark song. Uh, yeah, very dark. Yeah. And I, I think I remember because I went and um, chatted about this with a friend who who is much more into this world than I am about this. And I, and I said, you know, I, this is something that I felt really, really uneasy about. And I was saying, you know, how, how do you kind of go and sing about this stuff, you know, with with any kind of degree of conscience? And they uh, they were like, oh, yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, there you go. For me, when I first read these lyrics, I thought, here's a song about a woman who is not being given a fair chance. And of course, she's killing her children and abhorrent crime. But you're constantly reminded that she's all alone and that I wasn't totally comfortable with that idea just to sit, just to sing the lyrics as given. But there are lots of folk singers who are. Hmm. Having gone away and listened to a lot of other versions, uh they are just singing the lyrics as they are and i guess maybe that there is a culture in in folk music of you just preserve the lyrics sure but... yeah so did did you get a sense from it the first time that the that the lyrics weren't being particularly sympathetic or what did you think did you think that they were or they weren't the first time i thought that they weren't very sympathetic on repeated listens i noticed other, that there are there are lyrics in there that 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 shed a different light on the story uh, particularly of course the repeated refrain of all alone and all alone and alone um yeah which is just constantly reminding you that that she's she's sort of ab- whether she's abandoned or yeah that's interesting cuz i did a little bit of reading around this uh and people think that uh that this tune uh, presumably came around at a time when uh, the crime of infanticide was a particularly, uh, you know, particularly being picked up as one that was about the worst that you could do. I mean, no one's going to sit here and argue that it's a good, it's a good thing, but it was. This was a time when they were particularly zeroing in 
on this crime as something that needed to be sort of stamped out. Does it go hand in hand with um, that the one of the one of the worst things is for children to be unbaptized? Where did it come up? Well, I, I was reading some folk stories about ghostly hordes of unbaptized children <laughs> from the sort of twelfth century. Uh, it was a big thing. It was a big motif they used. The idea of of just illegitimate children generally. Um, you know, these. I think. I think in whatever reading of this story, it sounds like these are children who were who were just not wanted. Mm, mm. Um, and so that perhaps there's something of that in there as well. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's very black and white. That was my first reading. It was very. It's very black and white. And I think it's really cool that when you explore further and you listen to different versions then there are shades of grey that people have tried to uh, bring into it so tell us about the Emily Portman version yeah sure so uh, so Emily Portman uh, is a, it was one of the singers in the uh, Furrow Collective she, she's written a tune it's not it's not a version of this it's a sort of it's almost like her response to it mm. uh, it's a tune called Borrowed and Blue on her album Coracle I remember playing this to you because I really I really just I love the, the whole vibe of the of the thing as well and, and I think what she does does with uh, with the lyrics uh, especially when you know the background is really is really clever um she essentially i think what she's trying to do is to kind of pad out this image uh, and pre- present a much more rounded 3d picture of of this woman and what pressures she might be under so it kind of talks about her you know and it uses lots of bird language as well which uh, i think is a bit as part of her shtick she um uh, starts off um giving like this idea of this uh, this this mother bird who's kind of got these two chicks to to now feed and is high up in this nest and uh, you know all alone and then the the song moves through these kind of this kind of gradual sense of of isolation mm. from her, her family uh, you know things like what you know what are her family going to think all these pressures maybe a sort of uh, a religious pressure there's a, there's a line she picks up on that's in in the version that we've uh, we've we posted, which is uh, "Honorable Mary, pity me." Uh, so there's a clear sort of uh, religious pressure there as well. And ultimately, I think what she, you know, Emily leaves this tune unresolved in that sense. But it almost like it's like if that was the backstory to to what then may have gone down in the rest of the Cruel Mother tune. There's a much more uh, complete picture there. Yeah. Uh, much more sympathetic. Yeah. Yeah. Very much a response rather than a version. One of the things actually that we spoke we've spoken about whilst uh, developing this is the fact that at a time when folk music and folk storytelling were the methods of mass communication before mass media, and perhaps this is about as much of a shade of grey as you can present. And like we say, there are some lyrics there that could be interpreted as sympathetic. But really, people need to be reminded that there are people out there who do do things like this. Uh, I read a, um, one person talking about uh, that they uh, originally heard this. Their, their grandfather used to sing this to them <laughs> while they were sort of sat on their knee, you know. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think it very much fits into that category of uh, your kind of grim fairy tales. Yes. This is where you learn learn morality, learn, learn to be, uh, you know, learn the base level of morality. So I, I guess that they're not trying to hammer in too much subtlety too early on yeah, I guess. yeah cool so should we talk about what we did with it yeah sure do you want to go first yeah so when we first decided we were going to do this idea you sent me a photograph of the book that you'd taken out of so i had the lyrics and the melody to go on but no chords or anything so i was that's that was the first step is figuring out some chords for it and what i came up with uh i'll play it actually hang on so it's interesting, actually, because instinctively I put this in A minor, but I think instinctively you put it in C major, right? Something and like it, that, yeah. It could, could be in either. Um, it could be in any number of modes or anything like that. But for me, it was definitely in A minor, so I knew I was using an A minor chord. And then the other chord that I chose, and there's just two chords running all the way through this. Yeah. Uh, the other chord I chose was, it's very similar to A minor. <laughs> But it's based on a B flat in the in the bass there. Right. But the important thing is that it's also got an E and an A in it. So yeah, yeah. So that gives it gives it a sort of Lydian sound. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The B flat. That's the way I've been thinking about it. The B flat is sort of like a Lydian chord, and then the A minor is a Phrygian. But yeah. which means that uh, I mean I was still mostly singing in a minor key. But but that's what allows me to do the sort of uh, chromatic. Um, all alone, all alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that's where you get the flattened second from is the Phrygian mode. Yeah. But then the whole thing, I just sang over those two chords, and it was, and I was stabbing those chords. It was. All alone, all alone. Yeah. 
I'm, and really the first way I was singing it was, and this didn't transfer to the final arrangement, for whatever reason I couldn't make that work, but but I was really quite screaming it. And uh, so the chorus <laughs> then was going, Seven long years, a tongue in a bell. Yeah. Seven long years, a her in hell. <laughs> <laughs> which is fun, right? And there's yeah. an acoustic version there, which, you know, maybe at some point then I'll do that at a gig or something. But it ended up being sort of a lot more moany, all alone, all alone. Yeah, a little bit less Metallica. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. So I was doing the whole thing like that for a long time. So I should actually talk about the lyrics uh, before yeah, before sure. I move on to talking about the arrangement as well. Because I, I like like you as well, and like other people who have worked with this tune, had a bit of a crisis around uh, how do you handle this situation of a woman who actually, you might, well, I certainly felt sim- more sympathetic for than I felt like the lyrics were conveying. And so I didn't change lots of it, but I did put in a line about her, her the husband being absent and the husband being a jerk for being yeah. absent and just trying to shift the blame a little bit more yeah. of her. But roughly, I've still stuck to it. I condensed the lyrics down so that I had fewer verses. One of the things that I always struggle with with these folk ballads is just loads and loads of verses, and I need to yeah. find a way to tell the story quicker and also put in a chorus, which I'm really glad to see a few other people have done as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, for me, the song, the music I listen to has choruses, so I want to put choruses in my music. Yeah, you, you pretty much would write all choruses if it was left to you, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Some of the songs I do for this will be all chorus. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I also chopped off the EO on Alone and Alonio down by a Greenwood side EO. I yeah. thought that's not the way I speak, so I'm not going to sing like that either. Yeah, uh, that is interesting. But then other people have included that, yourself included, and yeah. I think it's, it works really well. when it. But, but for me, I just wasn't feeling that. Yeah. So when it came to the arrangement, I struggled for a long time. I actually sent you a version which was quite different from what it ended up being. But the key to it was remembering that there are those two notes, the A and the E, running all the way through it. So I started by designing a synth that would sit on those two notes all the way through the song. The synth's quite grating. It's a couple of saw waves, slightly detuned. Yeah, it's because like, that's the first thing you hear, isn't it? And, and it's yeah, really, yeah. really piercing sound, really sets the tone for the, for the rest of it. You kind of know where well, you kind of... You don't know what to expect, but you know that something's coming. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then that was, I mean, once once I designed that synth and just copied and pasted it all the way through the track, that was pretty much it done. I added some rhythmic bits. There's a mandolin. There's another synth, which is a bit sharper. And, of course, there's a guitar. There's a bass, which is just the guitar tuned down an octave. I have a bass guitar, but I get effective results doing that, so I just did that. The guitar melody was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, the, the synth that's like the sharp one, uh, the one that's sort of doing dink, dink, stabs. Yeah. I played a melody on that, but I still had the delay on, so it doubled it and it put it in that sort of double time rhythm. And it was a complete mistake, but I thought, actually, that sounds quite cool. I'll try and emulate that on the guitar, which is what I did. And yeah, in the final version, you hear them both layered on top of each other. Seven long years, a tongue in a bell Seven long years, a porter in hell You'll be seven long years, a bird in a cage And many more years all alone All alone, all alone Down on a green So do you want to tell us a bit about yours? Yeah, sure. So I actually wasn't really sure what to do with that. I think the melody that's in the in the book, I, like I thought I was going to do a uh, quite a different take on it and actually really change it up quite a lot. But in the end, I I actually went with what was in the book. And uh, when I was when I was kind of a bit stuck and working through it, I, I did what is a classic composition cop out. Uh, if you write on guitar a lot and you're not sure what to do and you're not getting inspired, just, you know, go for a an alternate tuning so uh <laughs> so i, I tuned to uh dadgad that's uh that's low string d i'm not going to go through them all you can you can google that and uh and i kind of figured out the melody on that and then kind of just figured out just tried to work out what the natural where my fingers were landing what natural kind of progression mm. was that came off of that and uh and i think i've got quite a nice sort of modal sounding uh pattern which i'll i'll kind of play for you now so Thank you. 
Okay, so the thing that I really like about that is that it starts off with that kind of that's sort of quite an ambiguous chord. There's no real major in there. Yeah. It's actually What is it? Would you can you describe the chord? I think it's really it's a it's a That's a that's a sort of minor chord but it's stacked on top of a of a different of a sort of like a D kind of just an open D there. Um but then when you get to the second half of it it gets a it, I give it this sort of uh the you get the uh That kind of sound, which gives it a bit more of mm. it, ch- kind of changes the quality of it a little bit. So you think it's in one thing, yeah. and then it, and then it kind of diverts to something else, which I really like. Um, so I kind of went with that. I ended up doing it on an electric guitar in the end. Uh, I have been listening to quite a lot of uh, things like Phoebe Bridges, which is quite a sort of slouchy, um, like very American, kind of washed out sounding stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I thought, I thought, oh, let's just give that a go. Um, so I really liked that. What I realised after doing it was that uh, the pattern is actually very similar, um, probably identical to um, the Aeneas Mitchell tune, How We Build the uh, Wall. Yeah. So particularly that, like that, uh, okay, that kind of figure yeah. at the end. That's pretty much directly from there. But you know. Uh, I feel like it's different enough. Oh yeah, loads um, of songs use that as well. <laughs> Come on, yeah. So, uh, so that was that was the basis of the song, and I kind of sang it through quite a few times. So, you, so you wanted to change quite a lot of the, the lyrics in mm. your version. I ended up just keeping them the same. That was how yeah. I how I reconciled the issue with uh, with the lyrical content. Uh, was just I'm you know it's not my song. I'm just gonna yeah. I'm gonna like take the version that's in the book, and it's my sort of I'm gonna let it speak for itself a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I did change a few lyrics. I think. Like there was a the whole thing about bat and ball uh, playing playing bat and ball is oh, the, right, is the yeah. thing that felt really unnatural to me for some reason. So I ended up just changing it to playing down the lawn, which is perhaps okay. even less natural. But <laughs> I just I, you know there's little tweaks that I did, but I did keep in things like uh, like the EOs um, in yeah. you know that that you talked about. I I felt after a while they started to feel quite natural. Yeah, which... that's interesting. Yeah, because so another thing that um, I I think I wanted to pick up on, and you said again it was a process of becoming more natural with it. It mm. was the rhythms uh, where where I'm doing all alone, all alone, and yeah. down by a green wood side. You've got down by a green wood side, yo. So you've yeah. got those squ- squash together notes. Uh, yeah, little sort of snaps and things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And again, it's not it's not a natural part of of what I've generally written, but it did start to feel quite natural after a while. Yeah. I think once I had the vibe of the of the song kind of pinned down. It sort of just flowed uh, much more easily. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about the drums because I love when the drums come in when that kick first hits. It's great. Yeah, sure. I think I I wanted to have this this nice sort of because the the pattern I'd picked on the guitar has a sort of quite a, like kind of subtle drive to it. But when I moved it to the electric guitar, it loses a bit of that sort of. Yeah, okay. It loses the pulse that you get from it. So I wanted to stick a pulse in, but I wanted it to be a bit slower than that as well and really sort of like breathe. Yeah. Uh, and so w- what I went for was a just a kind of uh, bass hit um, and then followed a few bu- a few beats later by uh, a kind of snare hit. But I wanted that to have this really sort of crunchy kind of yeah. um, almost Billie Eilish kind of style of uh, just like... That yeah, kind of uh, thing. So what I did is I just layered a load of sort of snare sounding noises just slightly off off kilter from one another. Yeah, because I thought it might have been a delay or something like that. But actually, it's just literally different sounds put slightly out of time with each other. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, yeah, I I feel like that's quite effective. I think I think you say you like that. So, yeah, you know, yeah, good. totally. I think it's really that's really good. Yeah. And then aside from that, uh, it was just uh, sort of changing the texture a little bit. Um, took took a guitar pattern and took it up an octave and yeah. uh, layered some more delay over that and I think I, I'm really happy with the overall vibe of it. Yeah, um, yeah. it took me a second listen to uh, realise that there was more than one guitar because they all sort of blend together and you've got this bed of uh, of guitar underneath. Mm, yeah, yeah. I also double tracked the vocals as well which uh, yeah. is a new thing for me. I think for me it helps to sort of take it outside of the, you know, so what, in, in your version you know you've got this and in quite a few of the versions that people have sent in there's this one voice sort of narration type piece. Yeah. And for me, I wanted to really abstract the the the, the vocals from the, the the content of the lyrics again. Right. So um, so I felt like having a double track almost gave it even more of a of a sort of commentary feel to it. Oh, 
long years. Cool. So should we talk about some other versions then? Yeah, absolutely. We've had some really good submissions here. Absolutely, yeah. So the first one we got through was Ian Jackson. Yeah. So Ian's gone for a very acoustic take. He's written a song on the guitar. I actually spoke to Ian about this, um, and he was saying he was out walking, and he, he had this idea in his head, and he was out walking, and he was sort of thinking about, you know, where do you keep a gun? He was thinking in the closet, or and then it was under the pillow, <laughs> and then that was that was his spark of inspiration that led to... Completely rewriting the lyrics and the melody. Yeah. I, you know, I really like that. I really like when people just take it as a starting point and write a response. Again, yeah. Also, he put in a chorus. So I, I did, yeah, I was speaking to Ian and, and we were both talking about how we need music to have choruses. <laughs> you know, sometimes people really pull off the verse after verse method uh, and it's great. But for us in our composition method, having a chorus and that cool mother is, I, yeah. I really like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so so Ian Jackson is referencing another song called Carlisle Hall, which I can't find a reference to anywhere. I can't find it online, but clearly he's picked that up. And and the Wikipedia page for the Cruel Mother says that this is a common thing to mix those two songs. So, but I really like that that he's woven in another song that he he felt was sort of important and and supported these lyrics. Mm. All recorded on a, a, I, I believe, a USB microphone. I don't know whether it's a blue, blue Yeti or something like that, but a good sound. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, and considering that, I think it sounds great. Yeah, it's a nice. Um, I think it must be a twelve-string guitar or something. Yeah, it's really rich, isn't it? Yeah, really rich. Yeah, bright. Mm. It, actually, out of interest, uh, Ian runs a folk club in Hereford, which I oh. did used to go to it when I lived right. when I lived there. Uh, yeah, so so he's he's working with this sort of music quite a lot and he's yeah. in contact with a lot of people around Hereford who are knows this stuff. Yeah, next yeah. month's song is from Hereford, so I'll be expecting another <laughs> <laughs> another take from him. But mother, mother, you didn't care at all. You left me dying by the car line wall. Mother, mother. So the next one we had in was from Pomegranate Jones, which is entirely instrumental. Uh, picks up the picks up the melody towards the end, but but sort of abstract and sort of a montage approach, isn't it? So it's yeah. got Foley in the background. Yeah, yeah. The first thing that struck me about this was the artwork, which is just incredible. Yeah, I, I think yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah. And and the montage in the artwork really reflects the montage in the sound. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I really like this one actually. I think it's sort of sort of really because I thought I thought it sounded like a sort of ambient noise pastoral kind of thing. Right. Uh, where you've got a really um, you know some really sort of classically English and then like you know some pretty pretty heavy synth work going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a lot a lot of kind of a lot of reverb, a lot of reversed noises, uh, but all all with this sort of lilt over the top. And then yeah, it kind of gradually kind of transforms into something that's got kind of a really kind of overwhelming crushing feeling about it. Yeah, so so they say so we try to replicate that by making the music start off tranquil like being in a wood and then kind of getting more uncanny and restless. Yeah. yeah There's yeah. a point in it where a huge blown out bass synth or something comes in and mm. it sort of distorts in the speakers and it really all sounds like it's falling apart. I think that's yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was really effective. So, yeah, we had a couple of submissions that were completely instrumental, uh, and this was one of them. Uh, so what they've done with the with the lyrics is quite abstract as opposed to uh, any kind of particular tweaks making it into choruses and things like mm. that. So, um, yeah. But I think, I think it's really effective. Yeah.
great. So the the next one we're looking at is uh, Audio Youth. Um, Jack, do you want to have a uh, give me your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. So Audio Youth, uh, based in Berlin, it's a solo producer. I was, again, I was in touch with this guy, and he was saying um, it's here's an interesting thing. The majority of it is all recorded live. Oh really? Just him in his studio in Berlin, and he's got oh, all the gosh. all these synths and drum machines, and they're all sort of running together, uh, so they're all clocked together. He was saying he the first thing he wanted to do was discard the melody so that he didn't have to work strictly with rhythm. Yeah, yeah and yeah. I think that's one of the nice things about it is it sort of flow, flows naturally without there need to be any strict beat. Yeah, interesting. Because, yeah, it's got that sort of sinister spoken word kind of feel to it. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking it actually reminds me quite a lot of some of those Ben Frost uh, records. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, really visceral, uh, and it really sort of highlights the story. And then, then, yeah, the the big bit is the seven long years when it gets to that section. Yeah, 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 yeah. They've used the seven long years refrain, same as me. And I just wanted to pick up that, as I was reading on the Wikipedia page about this, it says, the, the ballad exists in a number of variants, in some of which there are verses where the dead children tell the mother she will suffer a number of penances, each lasting seven years. Yeah. E.g. seven years for Ring a Bell, seven years Porter in Hell. Those verses properly belong in The Maid and the Palmer. So it's from another song. Right, yeah. Uh, which, but I, but I just think it's funny that both both me and Audio Youth separately decided that's that's the hook. <laughs> it's actually <laughs> not even from the original song. I mean, I think there's just something about seven long years that as a as a phrase is like you know, it's, and it and it repeats in the tune. And yeah, I, like if you were if you were looking for a hook, then that that's be where that'd be where you find it. So yeah, interesting that you have both picked up on that. Yeah. I, oh, also, I got a similar vibe. Uh, have you watched Stranger Things? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's moments where there's just suddenly, just out of nowhere, there's just this like really huge bass note. Right. Like, I think I think he 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 sort of factors uh, th- sort of throws that kind of element in there as well. That's from the guy who. That's the Buam from the guy who did in the Inception soundtrack. Who is, oh, is that? It? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It was sort of. It came about from the Inception soundtrack. Hans Zimmer. That's his oh, trademark. Oh, sure. Buam. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it brings out the darkness so much in the lyrics. Like, Definitely, that's, that's yeah. Not, he's really gone heavy on on uh, making this a dark interpretation. Yeah, not felt any need to couch it. No. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> So James Parrish. Yeah, this is an interesting take. I really like uh, I really like the vibe of this tune. He's gone for sort of uh, for me it's quite relaxed summer vibes if anything. Yeah, yeah. Um and so the lyrics uh he's kind of got quite a bit of uh, reverb but like quite prominent reverb on the on the vocals and that, that for me that pushes them back a little bit and he sort of tweaked them a little bit to sort of take the edge off I think. Yeah, let's just I just want to read what he said actually because he had an interesting bit of Yeah, so so he actually was the person who came back to us and when we asked about uh, why why he'd taken the approach he did, he was the person who was saying I felt sorry for the woman and and clearly had a similar crisis to what we had. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, perhaps everyone did at some point, but he was very clear to highlight what does it say? A woman who in the climate in which it was written would have been such a shame on society. Bastard children were mainly in the lower classes, which was mainly because of the noble men taking advantage of women worker staff. So yeah, he, he felt sorry for her and I think uh, that's interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. Reminds me of Mac DeMarco, reminds me of Devendra Banhart, that psychedelic songwriter sort of vibe. I, I really like that style. And and actually yeah. we should say the, the initial version we shared of this, he's actually sent a, another mix in, which is a lot cleaner and comes across a lot nicer, I think. So go and mm. check it out again if you listen to it the first time around. Down by the 
So Asymptotes actually is the only person apart from you who has changed the name of the song. That is true, actually, yeah. Seven long years rather than Cruel Mother. Yeah, that's interesting. I think well, what's what, this is a, a largely instrumental take. There are so there are some vocals in there, and I was like, straining quite hard to listen to what actually what they're saying. And I think they are they are lyrics from the from the song, and particularly the, the seven long years bit. I think those are in there, but they're very much at the sides of the mix, very yeah. much, uh, and the, and they're very much masked. Uh, and what I think is interesting about this take is there's quite a jangly melody. Uh, right, yeah. But then, but then the synths are quite grinding as well. But it's, I think it's the it's the percussion that that grabs you at first. Uh, yeah, you've got some quite uh, strong strong kind of bass and like off kilter uh, melody, uh, off kilter rhythms going on. Yeah, I, for me, it's it's quite a uh, you know it's got a lot uh, that kind of um, synth era, sixty five days of static type stuff. Yeah, a lot of a lot of kind of electronica with a bit of post rock thrown in. Yeah, yeah. So there's a really cavernous feel to it all. Everything's really quite big, and uh, I don't know if there's some. That, there's various synths doing things all in this big space, and with the with the vocal actually going from left to right, it's not even just that it's pushed out right to the sides, but it's mm. moving around this space. The spaciousness of this is what really stood out to me. So Paul and Steve Moisey, this is a take where they reference quite heavily another version of it by uh, Martin Simpson, Andy Cutting and Nancy Kerr. Yeah. Which when we looked it up, we had a little Google of some of the lyrics. A gentle hearts be to me true is the refrain that he uses mm. or they use even. That's that's taken. We, we found another version of this song called The Duke's Daughter's Cruelty, which is contained in the English Broadside Ballad Archive. Oh, it's part of the University of California. Good to know they're collecting our songs over there. <laughs> uh, so, so, so I guess there's here's another version of this song which made it to California, but um, is is very similar but has a slightly different refrain. It's telling the same story though. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, what I found really interesting about this, having heard the other versions, is this is a, this is very much an acoustic take. They've, they've recorded all of this uh, just you know themselves layering them up, playing them together. Um, there's a lot of interesting work with rhythms there. They're working with a lot of polyrhythms. It's five. It's in five four. The main. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's already uh, you know it's already kind of using some that, that's, uh, that's that's you know less often used uh, rhythmic devices. And then they've actually used quite a few. For me, I think they've used quite a few of the techniques that we talked. About out for the other version yeah. so um there's the the bits that really really kind of jump out at me are where there's like a like a really long double bass note that yeah. just kind of you know and there's that same sort of guttural Hans um, Zimmer again <laughs> yeah 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 Hans Zimmer he's everywhere um <laughs> and there's a there's a, another kind of you know a, a bit where they uh they throw in a, a kind of pipe melody yeah. as well uh so a bit more of a, an instrumental take as well but I think I mean, you know, these are guys who really know their stuff. I think, yeah, and that really comes out. Yeah, I think I, I think alongside Ian, these these are our folkies. Although Ian actually, I know, does a lot of blues and Americana and and, sure. and country and things like that. Uh, these two are our, our, our stalwart folk musicians. Uh, yeah, that's it. But they but they've gone they've gone with uh, with quite a you know like quite a, quite a non standard interpretation of it yeah. in that world so yeah absolutely yeah uh, so i yeah i really like this take i think it's really effective yeah 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 the rhythm's really nice i really like the sort of spoons percussion that's yeah i love that yeah, yeah, charming yeah. I, yeah, and that's it because it sounds it sounds very you know like they they they've not uh you know it's it's not been it's not been extensively produced so it's really all about the arrangement and I think that's uh that's what's that's what I really like about it is that yeah. it's that kind of slightly raw edge to it yeah. Also, Cruel Mother. Yeah, if you want to have a go at Cruel Mother, we're not we're not saying that we won't uh, be interested in, in the next month if you have a go. So just send it over and we'll share it on. We'll be really glad to listen to what you do with it. 
Yeah, totally. Uh, I think what we what we found really is that uh, everyone's got something to add, but we realise people work at different rates, and uh, and so we want people to everyone to feel like they can contribute because uh, really we just want to hear what people what people have to offer. Okay, so do you want to talk about bitter with it then? Yeah, yeah. So I I chose I've got a confession to make here because I chose this song knowing virtually nothing about it. Okay. The reason I chose it, uh, well, for a start, I've chosen it for this podcast because I was already working on a version of this. So I already have some progress I've made uh, on this song. I found it in this book, which is called Bushes and Briars, Folk Songs Collected by Ralph Vaughan Williams, edited by Roy Palmer. I really recommend it as a book. It's got the songs organised under subheadings of where they were collected from. So this one was collected from Hereford. So yes, Ian, I expect another version from your <laughs> from, from the Hereford contingent. So, so the reason I chose this is because I was looking for a song with one verse. Because earlier this... <laughs> so I chose one with 11 verses. <laughs> <laughs> so earlier this year I did a song called Western Wind, which is based on a single verse. And the, that, there is only one verse remaining of that, so that's the verse that you sing. But with this one, I was flicking through this book and I found that this had the description... It says, although a single verse appeared in 1868, it was not until 1905 that a full version of this carol was available in print. Hmm. So I thought, great, well, maybe that works with just one verse. And I went to the final verse, which is one, the one that mentions the bitter withy. And I thought, I'll just fix it all around that. Like I said, I like songs with choruses. I'll just use <laughs> that as a chorus and we'll just repeat it loads. So then, obviously, once I suggested it for this and I had to go and do a little bit more reading about it. I'd not picked up on this word carol, so I've chosen a Christmas carol for the for the <laughs> dawning of spring. But basically the story goes, it's about Jesus and it's saying Jesus is talking to his mum and he says, "Can I go out and play play at ball?" And mm-hmm. she says, "Yep, but I don't want to hear of any wrongdoing while you're out there." So he goes out and he meets up with three boys and he says, do you want to play ball with me? And they say, no, you're poor. They say, we're lords and ladies sons born in a bower. You're a poor maiden's child born in oxen stall. And he says, oh, right. Well, you know, if that's the way you feel, I'll show you. And he (laughs) takes them on a bridge of the beams of the sun over the sea uh, where they were drowned. So it's sort of like a a Pied Piper sort of tune. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. But then meanwhile, the mothers of these, uh, the, the ladies who are the mothers of these three boys go back to Mary, Jesus' mother, and say, call your child home. He's drowned our kids. And so she says, yes, of course. And she lashes him with a bitter <laughs> withy, which is a branches of a willow tree. Yeah. Uh, and she, she gave him slashes three. And then he cur- the, the final verse, which is the, one, the only one I'm using, is where he curses the withy. Right. <laughs> so, so yeah, that that's the story basically. I I think you'll you'll testify it's not a well known Christian song. Yeah, or... I mean the one you just described that I was thinking, oh, classic Jesus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Always up to no good, getting lashed by his mother. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting this because since you've mentioned it, I've I've been having a bit of a dive into into the you know the history of it to try and work out how this this story ends up in a 14th century English folk song. Yeah. So if, if anyone knows the Bible as it is, you've got the four classic canonical gospels. These are the four gospels, the accounts of Jesus' life, which were written within about 100 years of Jesus. And they're notoriously uh, scant on details of uh, Jesus' youth. So I kind of around the first, second century, uh, like a couple of texts that popped up uh, of people sort of, having a go at trying to fill out those gaps. It's not this story exactly, but there's a variation of it that, that crops up in the infancy go- gospel of Thomas. So these these texts, they, they didn't make it into the Bible. They weren't regarded as scripture by any any kind of group, but they, they kind of were still hanging around. And uh, so you fast forward to the later Middle Ages, and after kind of centuries of fascination on, on Jesus as a, as a divine figure, people started to get interested in Jesus, the human figure. And so there's a sort of renewed interest in this in Europe of the humanity of Jesus. Uh, and I think because what, what you picked up on is that there's a very sort of clear class theme. Yeah, yeah. Which, uh, which I, I don't think in, in the accounts that this is based on, I don't think that's in there. So that's, that's, a, that's an English edition, I think. So, so what it says here in the description, it says, nevertheless, it seems to be of considerable antiquity, this song being based on incidents in the apocryphal Gospels, pseudo-Matthew and Thomas, Hmm. transposed into an English setting. These in turn have their roots in even earlier stories, Oriental and Celtic. But to me, this reads like an English folk story. This is a story about an English child. So it's very much like a song that's been written 
just by English people, yeah, uh, a yeah, story yeah. that's useful to them for whatever reason, but only half really based on the Bible as we know it. Yeah, yeah, and and the interesting so the interesting bit is that the last line, uh, the the withy shall be the very first tree that will perish at the heart. That's the yeah. uh, that's the line, isn't it? Um, yeah, which. You know, and and that's a. Uh, I mean, I don't know a lot about you know trees, but as I understand it, that's uh, that's what willow trees do. So there's a sort of you know, I, I, you can imagine that being a sort of uh, a, a kind of folk understanding of uh, of a reading of of what happens to willow trees. Is it's be you know, it's because Jesus cursed them. You know, you can imagine <laughs> that being uh, that being part of the the kind of cultural idiom world. Yeah. So I'll just run through talking about a few versions of these. We'll be sharing versions over the course of the month and the the lyrics and the chords and the melody are all there for, already for you to learn. Yeah. Most of these versions use roughly the same chord progression, which is the one that we've shared. Uh, there is a version by Kerfuffle mm-hmm. uh, who put it in a minor key and use elements of God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen as well. They never yeah. actually sing those words, but they play that melody, uh, which... Yeah. Yeah, quite quite a lot. So they, they've matched <laughs> up those two songs. So also versions by... There's a group called Abyssal Withy who've done an a cappella version. So you'd think maybe that's the definitive version, but <laughs> who knows. <laughs> Maddie Pryor, singer of Steel Eye Span, has done both a studio version and a live version. Uh, there's a version here by The Young Tradition. Like I say, we'll share these versions mm-hmm. as we go through. I'll just play a little bit of yeah, it. Yeah, go for it. Using the chords that are commonly used, it's in A, but it starts on the E chord, but there's just these three chords, A, D, and E. So if you listen to these versions that are using this chord progression, some of them sound like they might be quite complex, but really they're just based on these three chords. Yeah. So I'll just play a little bit. <laughs> As it fell out on a high holiday, some drops of rain did fall. Our saviour asked his mother dear if she should play at ball. And I'll play the last verse as well. Oh, bitter withy, the bitter withy, thou causest me to smart. Oh, the withy shall be the very first tree that shall perish and die at the heart. So yeah. very roughly something there is, is what you might follow. But but really play around with it. Try it in a minor key like kerfuffle. Maybe just yeah. change those chords to minor chords and see how you have to sing with it. Like I say, I'm just using the last verse anyway. So Yeah. I mean, I frankly find that maddeningly twee. So I'm going to be <laughs> absolutely going at it with a hacksaw. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> cool. Yeah, we look forward to hearing what you come up with. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed the first episode of Old Tunes Fresh Takes. Just a reminder, if you want to take part and learn the bitter withy along with us, go and check out our Facebook, Twitter or SoundCloud pages. There you'll find everything you need to get started, including scores, chord sheets and lyrics. Links to these pages can be found in the description of this episode. We'll be recording our next episode on the 15th of May to make sure it's ready in time for release on the 18th. So if you'd like to be included in the podcast, then try and get your version to us by that date. That's the 15th of May to get your versions included in the podcast. If you can't manage that date, then please do send your recordings whenever you can, as we'll be continuing to share them across our social media pages. Once again, this is for absolutely everyone to take part, regardless of your ability or musical style. We're really just looking forward to hearing your fresh takes.